So we're going to start one of three chapters on uh, contract law. And it's something that you're familiar with, probably more familiar than you think. Because when I say contract, what kind of contract do you think of? Maybe a union contract, an employment contract, something you need to sign your name on. That's, that's pretty common. Written contracts. How many of you read chapter 8? Oh my goodness, just for the recording, all the hands are going up in the class. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so if you read chapter 8, you found out there are other types of contracts than written, signed contracts. And so if you kind of expand your mind in terms of what could be a contract, there's probably a lot. In fact, I challenge you, just because we haven't seen each other in a while, I'm feeling spunky, drank a lot of coffee this morning, to say that you haven't been involved in some type of contract today. Anybody? Nothing. Nothing? You, am I scaring you? All right. Right. Almost like a contract, yeah. So um, you have some type of, even the card is an agreement. Right? There's certain terms to that card, and certainly you can um, say that there is a contract in terms of uh, parking and paying to park your car. Uh, even this glass, right? The idea that you pay consideration and exchange, you're supposed to be getting something, right? So, what is that again? Jokes. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at what a contract is and what it is not, including the objective theory of contracts, what are the elements of a valid contract are, and you know, what makes an offer, what makes an acceptance, and a little bit about um, what contracts look like online. And finally, we'll talk about consideration, which, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up here, so maybe you think consideration means loving, being kind, all that. But no, it means something a little different. I, mean, I guess it does mean that too, but, you know, not for this class. So where does contract law come from? It comes from the common law. Remember that? Wasn't that long ago? Where do we get the common law? Don't say England. Where does common law come from? Please. <laughs> One at a time. Yes? <laughs> Cases. Yeah, to summarize what you just said because maybe it didn't pick up on the microphone. Cases, right? Common law is case law. Cases are decided by judges, judges or juries, courts, right? So contract law is really all about, you know, cases over time that have been decided related to contracts. And it is modified in some situations, and the example up there is, if it is a specific type of contract, like a contract for the sale or lease of goods, then we have the Uniform Commercial Code, which is what kind of law? Statutory law, which comes from? Statutes, which come from? Legislature, right? Yes, good. At both the federal and state level. So there's a body of common law out there about contracts, and then it gets reported in... Uh, restatements of contracts and then it gets modified sometimes by statute like the Uniform Commercial Code and supposedly provides stability and predictability that must be true it's on the slide but basically if you think about it the idea that we uh, track what agreements we have with our suppliers buyers is important because without it later it's what did we say? What did we agree to? Did you ever do that where you have a conversation with somebody and you think you have an agreement and then later you actually agreed to something different? I can see many of you aren't married. 
What's that? Because that happens all the time in marriage. Honey, I told you. You did? I don't remember that. Yeah. So, um, but it, contracts are important to business because they outline the rights and duties of the parties to contract. Contracts can have multiple parties, so they can be pretty complex. The parties are the promisor. You're going to see lots of ors and es for the rest of the semester. The promisor is the one making the promise, and the promisee the ones the promise is made to. In the context of business, these promises are made in good faith. Maybe they aren't really, but there's an assumption that they are. That when somebody makes a promise, that's what they really mean, unless we, uh, it ends up being to the contrary. So what is a contract? Whoops, I'll put it up there, but still, even though you've read the chapter and it's up there, I'll just throw it out to you. What is a contract? Who can summarize it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, agreement between two parties that can be used in court. Yep. Basically. Yeah, so it's not just an agreement, because you could agree with yourself. It's not just an agreement between two or more parties, because not everything we could agree to would be a contract. The only Agree, only when it's an agreement between two or more parties that could be enforced in court, is it a contract? Because there's certainly things we could agree to, but a court would never enforce. Like, what would be an example of that? Get a contract, get paid to do somebody. To what? <laughs> to, to kill somebody, yes. That Maybe that didn't pick up on the microphone there. So, yes, let's say you're, I know that's what you meant, right? Uh, maybe you're not happy with your quiz score, so you um, go on Craigslist and you contract to have me killed, right? Now, certainly you can enter into agreements online through Craigslist. Let's say you find somebody who's fully capable of killing me and the going rate for me is not very high. Most people are willing to do it for free, uh, but you know, let's say you enter into some type of agreement. Uh, let's say it's even in writing. You know, you get some person to sign saying they agree to kill me. What happens when you go to court? Going to jail. Right, right. <laughs> like, or you say, Your Honor, I paid the money and he's still alive. What's going on here? Right? The, court, <laughs> the court will not enforce that because to enforce that is to do something that's illegal. Right? And so you can think of any situation where parties agree to do something that's illegal, the court will not enforce it. Think about other illegal, illicit activities, right? Let's just use online gambling as an example. If it's illegal to do, then, you know, you, you can't go to court and say, where are my winnings? Because the court won't enforce that. Because to enforce it would be to basically have the court involved in something that's illegal to do. Speaking of gambling, did you guys hear the latest on the Gun Lake Casino? I was um, online last week, and um, there's something about the, the an, an appeal that might cause the casino to get closed down as soon as it's opened. Did you see that? There's like the two tribes that work together to supposedly like didn't have like close planning with their matchmaking. Well, there, yeah, there's this, there's a whole series of legal theories, but basically the idea was that um, the appeal didn't go forward, but then at the last moment, apparently, it, it is going to be able to, so. What? 21, to be 21, is that your question? I don't know. See, now I've hit on something you guys are interested in. <laughs> So maybe there's an exception. Hey, research that. Find out if on tribal land, under tribal law, the age is different.
Oh. Ah, I see. Yes. That is the Vegas feel, isn't it? To get everybody drunk so they don't know what they're doing. All right. Yeah, well, hey, I've hit it. You know, I thought maybe it was the, the content, but hey, if I just talk about gambling and intoxication, you guys are in. All right, so um, it's formed by two or more parties. Like I said earlier, it can't be by yourself, but it could be multiple. It could be more than two, although a lot of times we'll talk about buyer, seller, promisor, promisee. It could be multiple parties in one contract. And the failure to perform your part of the agreement is called a breach. And if there's a breach, that entitles the other party to damages, some type of remedy, which we've talked a little bit about already. Yeah. I had a question. Is it about gambling? No, okay. Yes. Oh, you're serious. You're going to try to kill me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so how would I go about that? What category would that fall under? Yeah. But um, when you buy something on there, what if it's not working? How does that work? Well, um, you mean who would have responsibility if it wasn't? Well, I mean, I would think that if you buy something and it doesn't work, that'd be a breach. Right? Whether it's at a store, it's online, or whatever, if you don't get what you purchased, then that would be a breach of performance on their part. Now, trying to go after who that might be could be fairly complicated, right? Um, from it could be, you know, related to, um, you know, if you you try to go after Craigslist, they're certainly going to say, not our problem. We just offer a way for people to buy and sell things. We we should not have responsibility. We're not a party to that contract, right? So we'd look at who the buyer and seller are. All the people in the hall are taking notes. <laughs> so if you don't get what you paid for, you certainly could sue for breach of contract. But then you get into, I mean, Craigslist is more local, right? So you might be dealing with Michigan law. Uh, another question? Yeah, it looks like you have to be 21. <laughs> So you went to their website? Yeah, it's and on their website that you have to be 18 to view their website and then in the process. Really? You have to be 18 to view their website? How is that possible? Yeah. Oh, okay. There's stuff on that site that... Interesting. But then you get in there and it says... Well, to say it's a casino gambling, you don't want children exposed to that type of... Well, yeah, you don't want to take them there. But on their website, I mean, are they doing online gambling? No, but the website would give them that feel. The website would give them that feel. Woohoo! So you guys are gambling in my class? Do you, you feel like it, though, don't you? Do you the Yeah. Yeah. Weird. So, but... but it, once you get in, it tells you you have to be 21 to get in, to even get in. Oh, and it is, it's strictly about the sale of alcohol. Uh, so maybe there's like restrictions in some places where you go, so get access to. Ah, okay. Well, we'll have to work that into our class somehow. <laughs> yes. V. Well, yeah, that'd be a bummer. <laughs> well, it was weird because, like, I'll post the article in the class, but basically 
like here's a hundred people out below that sign. You guys seen that sign on the highway? Like there's a sign on the highway that says fun's coming whatever day. There's a hundred people all out there going, woohoo, when they, when they turn it on and announce the day the place is supposed to open. And then the same day it comes out and says, and it might be closing. So, but yeah, it, that would be a bummer. Is that, what is it? Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, moving on. Objective theory of contracts. So, uh, we don't try to measure what's going on in people's mind as they intend to enter into a contract. Instead, the court, if there's a dispute, looks objectively at the circumstances surrounding the contract. What words are used in the contract? What the parties were doing? So, as we go along and we talk about cases, we'll see some examples of that. But, you know, if somebody says, well, I was thinking the price should be $10,000, but the contract says the price is $12,000, what's the court going to do? Go by what the contract says. Why is that important to you? Like, let's say you go out and I, I went out and I negotiated a price for a new van. Well, it was used. What's that? New to you. Yes, new to me. And so I um, negotiated back and forth with this guy. And then the weirdest thing, uh, waiting, 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 he comes from talking to his sales manager, which I was think of him on the other side of the wall drinking coffee or something. And he comes out and he go and he high fives me. <laughs> like, yeah, all right. He goes, we got a deal. Great. I said, because what I did is I went out and I, I got my own financing. I knew what I was going to pay for this thing. And I said, you, I'll do it with you if you can match the, the term, the interest and whatever. So he comes out and high fives me. And I said, you mind if we get a, like, a little more formal than that? Like, can we put that in writing? He's like, oh, yeah. He said, you need to go back and see the sales manager. They got all the paperwork back there. Right? So I go back there thinking the price is one thing. And then, you know, they're sign here, sign here. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's kind of an occupational habit of mine. I like to read before I sign things. So, I, you know, it really irritates them. I'm like, you know, I, you know, I get to the first page. And on the first page of the contract, it says, this is the term of your loan. This is how long it is. This is what your actual annual percentage rate is. This is how much it's going to cost you over the term of your loan. I'm like, that's nothing like what I agreed to. Well, yeah, we know, but... That guy out there, he did not really know what he's talking about. This is the official financing. Okay, it's still not what he said. And he goes, well, if we sold it to you for that, we'd lose money. Yeah, that's what I'm like. Oh, no, please don't lose money. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I said to him, either you put in writing what we agreed to or I won't buy it. I'm not upset at you. You're free to tell me it's going to cost more, and I'm free to choose not to do it. What if I entered into that contract knowing I'd hide five somebody earlier, but then the contract says something different? What's the court going to do? They're going to go, I, you're a lawyer. You let somebody high five you and believe that that's what the agreement was? We're going to go by the objective print on the contract, because you can bet they're not going to go back and say, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. We messed up. And then another thing we did is we, uh, we wanted a video player because we like to have our children in trances while we drive around. And because um, other than that, they scream. And so I would bring a video to the car lot and I would try out the video player before I was going to buy it because it was that important to us. Sure enough, right before we sign the paperwork, I stick a video in and it doesn't work. So I go in, I go, bad news, what's the problem? Video player does, oh, no, not a, not a problem. We'll fix that. Yes, you will. Either you put it in writing that you will fix it, and I'll sign it, or you fix it, and then I'll buy it. Wouldn't it be fun to deal with me? I mean, I mean what, what's going to happen later? Right? I enter into the agreement, and then I come back in there, and I say my video player is going to work. What are they going to say? We never agreed to fix that. 
because it ended up costing them a lot of money to fix it. Ah, well, they said it did. Who knows? But anyway, so what the party has actually agreed to is what you want to look at, not what I was thinking in my head or even what they were thinking in their head. All right, so a contract has to have these four elements. Make sure you know all of them and, hint, if one is missing, that's a problem. It's, for some of these elements, it's easy to see why it's a problem. Others, you might think it's a trick when later it's missing. You would think in order to have a valid enforceable contract, you need to have the parties agree. Right? And when you looked at your chapter, there were two parts to agreement. What were the two parts? What were the two things you need? Good. Offer and acceptance. Somebody makes an offer, the other party accepts those exact terms. That's how you get agreement. I say, I want to buy that van over there, and they say, we'll sell you that van over there. Not this van over here. Right? So we have to have a meeting of the minds, which I always envision two little brains walking out and shaking hands with each other. But you you got to be on the same, wave, same wavelength. Back to my earlier comments. Sometimes you're not always on the same wavelength. All right, so that's the first element, agreement. The next one is consideration, which doesn't mean be kind, means what? Promises supported by consideration. Consideration is, you guys can cheat, you can look in your book. Starts with a V. Right. It's something of value that's bargained for. Now, if I'm buying a van, what's the used car place getting out of it? Money. That's bargained for. Why don't they just say money then? Why do they have to use the fancy term like... That's right, it's not. What else could it be? Right. I could say, I'll do something for you for the van. Or I will trade you this for that. Right? A trade in. So we'll go into more detail about what is consideration and what would not be considered consideration. Capacity. Capacity has to do with your ability to enter into a contract. And it's not on the slide, but I'll tell you right now, there's two parts to it. One, the author stresses. The other, I don't think, gets stressed that much. Capacity has to do with your mental ability to understand what you're doing. That part, I think, they stress. Right. Yes? <laughs> yeah, so no one, right? No one, I mean, it's not like we put a meter up to you. Whoa, problem, you better not contract, right? Instead, it only becomes an issue if there's a dispute. And then it's up to the court to decide whether you had that capacity or not. So we're starting to set the stage for some of these defenses down here at the bottom of the slide. Like the idea that you didn't really intend to do what you did because you thought something different or there was something wrong with your thinking. And then the hard part about that is there isn't a real easy measure. You end up trying to prove that you lack the capacity. And if you truly lack capacity, that's kind of hard to do sometimes. Right? Uh, but there's a number of things that relate to capacity. Like you were mentioning the idea of uh, gambling and drinking, kind of keeping on that thing. It's possible that you get intoxicated to the point where you don't understand what you're contracting for. Right? So you might argue, I lack the capacity to enter the contract because I was intoxicated at the time. Yes? So, my last question. So, um, you're on the floor and you're gambling, and you're know, drunk, <laughs> you keep gambling. Yes. 
Yes. Thanks, this thanks, is a, this another bummer. Right. So can you track transfer your lack of capacity or common sense in one situation to another? I added that other part about common sense. Um, you no. Know, like, it's not a defense of paying your mortgage to argue that you were intoxicated in some other situation. Right. Now, is it possible that you enter into a mortgage while intoxicated? Yeah. Sure. I mean, think. I mean, lots of M words. Marriage. I mean, there's lots of <laughs> things that people enter into while intoxicated, right? What's that? Children. Children. <laughs> yes. So, but but so that you know, there's there's a whole. I mean, the the subsequent chapters go in more detail into this. Like, what are the different situations? Like minors is another example. As you read through this stuff and we cover it, you might be surprised. Minors can contract. Like for some reason, a lot of people come into this class thinking minors can't. They can't. There's some things they can't contract for. We've been talking about that, right? I mean, there's some things where the law says you can't do those kind of things. I really didn't know you couldn't go look at a website. I mean, I knew there were some websites that <laughs> children shouldn't go look at. I just didn't know that that would be one of them. Right. Yeah, I mean, who's had, who, who had a, you know, it was a while ago for me. But do, do any of you recall being in a contract before you were age 18? I mean, if you bought anything. Right? So maybe you were... Maybe you had an employment contract. Maybe you were, had a cell phone. Now, I'm not saying that you didn't have a cosigner or someone else on the contract, but I'm saying you contracted. Probably most of you did. You bought food, your job. Yeah, all, those, all those things are contracts. So uh, that's one part. The other part of capacity is that you're the right person to contract. Like, you contract for yourself, or you might contract as an agent for a company, but you can't, you don't have the capacity to enter into contracts for other people just because you want to. Like, let's say anybody in here need a new car? Sure. sure. Okay, so you tell me that. Last week, you told me that. And uh, so this week you come in, I'm like, good news, I got you a car. Like, awesome, I never got a teacher buy me a car. Oh, no, I didn't buy it for you. I contracted for you. You got a good deal, though. You should be able to make the payments. I can't do that for you, right? Unless you authorize me to do that. So when you say that, do you mean, like, they can't sign the other person's name? Or well, that could be it. I mean, if we're... I'm, I'm talking more about whether you're the right person to do it not so much you signing someone else's name on a contract or a well, check like, or something okay, like, like that. For example, like if somebody needs work done on a house, and it's not the house owner that contracts the work, is that an example? But still, couldn't the contractor take them to court and say, you said you were going to pay me for this amount of money? Right, so you, you could have an agent that represents you to enter into contracts. So let's say you contract with a general contractor to do something to your house. They could, in turn, contract with subcontractors or other people to, to do it. So, um, you know, part of the question is, what is the relationship between you and the contractor and the contractor and subcontractors, right? I mean, if, let's say it's to build a house. Well, when you enter into contract to have somebody build a house, you don't know who all they're going to use to subcontract with. You don't really necessarily care, right? You might tell them, I prefer this electrician or plumber or whatever, but you just want a house built, and your contract's with them. And if they go out and, and hire somebody to do work for them that does a crappy job, you're concerned because they're doing a crappy job on your house, but it's their problem, right? You, I mean, they should take care of that. You shouldn't have to take care of that. Yeah. So if it comes down to a lawsuit in a case like that, you would actually go after the general contractor. The general contractor yes. would go after the subcontractor. Yeah, Here, here's the flip side of that, too, is... You, um, when I was building my house, I um, got a construction loan 
to have it built. And one of the terms of releasing uh, money was making sure everybody got paid right. Because you didn't later want a subcontractor coming back and say, I never got paid, right? And you've paid the contractor, and then they kept the money, right? So you didn't want some subcontractor coming after you for something you've already paid to the contractor, so you wanted to be released from that liability. So it, you know, it works both ways. All right, and then the last element is legality. We talked a little bit about that already. The contract has to be for a legal purpose. And then uh, we mentioned defenses to enforceability, the idea that you didn't really agree, or the contract had to be in a uh, certain form to be enforceable. Here's the big one. Like we said earlier, um, a lot of people think contracts as written contracts. Most contracts are not. And some contracts have to be in writing to be enforceable. So we're going to talk more about it later, the statute of frauds, which is a statute that says these type of contracts have to be in writing. Even if you haven't read that or don't know about that, what kind of contracts do you think should be in writing? Right, leases, anything that has to do with an interest in land seems really important because you want everybody to know you're the party who's the tenant. Uh, car loans. Right? Yeah, so there's a number of reasons why you care about who knows you have title or, or who's responsible for paying a, a loan or who has a lien on the car. So there's a number of situations where you do need a writing. But other than that, we enter into lots of contracts where we don't actually put it in writing. We might not even say anything. So we'll talk about those situations too. So here's a, a way of looking at the formation of a contract. The first box on the left is bilateral versus unilateral. Bi means two, uni means one. Two what? Good. Yeah, a promise for a promise. There's a mutual exchange of promises, which might leave you with a question. All right, then uni means what? One, one promise. And if only one party's promising, what's the other party doing? Waiting on the code. Mm, mm, no. One party's making a promise in return for what? No. Action. They're looking for somebody to do something. So let me give you an example. This morning when I came out to come to work, my driveway was uh, kind of icy, and so I yelled over to the neighbor kid, I'll give you five bucks if you salt my driveway today. What am I asking him to do? It's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm asking him to salt my driveway. I'm, to use fancy terms that he won't understand because he's six, um, <laughs> I am making an offer to enter into a unilateral contract with him. And the only way he can accept my offer is what? Do to do it. That's key. I don't want his promise. I don't want him saying, Mr. Brand, I'll do it. I promise I'll do it. I don't want his promise. I want him to do it. Why is that so important? I get home today and my driveway is not salted. Has he breached the contract? No, he has not. Why not? Because it's not a there is no contract. It's an action. Right. There's no contract because there's no acceptance. Remember, the first element of a contract is offer and acceptance. The only way you're going to see this, you're going to see it on the final. The only way you can accept an offer to enter into a unilateral contract is by doing it, not by promising it. And this is important because in my example, you want to know if you actually have a contract or not. And I don't with him. 
Let's change it up a little bit. Hey, kid, I'll give you five bucks if you salt my driveway by 5 p.m. Because I know I'll be home after five. I get home, it's not salted. Has he breached the contract? Is after five. He still hasn't, right? Because he still can choose not to do it, and that's not a breach. Now, could I enter into a bilateral contract for him to salt my driveway? Yes. Sure. You guys can see me out there in the driveway with a written contract, making him sign, promising to do it with penalties if he refuses to do it by 5 p.m., right? You know, all the terms, type of salt, you know, it's all in there, right? So, the example that I gave you earlier, I buy a van from a used car dealer. Bilateral contract, right? The moment that I make my promise to pay and the moment that they make their promise to deliver what they sold to me, we have a contract. It's going to trick some of you. So let's say in that contract, one of the parties fails to deliver. What's that called? Like I fail to pay or they fail to deliver the van. That's called a breach. breach. Right? It's not complicated, but I'll put it in different terms. I'll say something like, I contract with the used car dealer to buy a van. Before they deliver the van, do I have an obligation to pay for it? Yes, I do. I did. I entered into a bilateral contract. I don't have the right to say, I'm not paying you until I get something, unless I agree to that. Now, could I enter into a contract? Let's say I go online and buy something through eBay. My father-in-law bought a Suburban through eBay, but, which actually turned out pretty well. But What if I enter into a contract with somebody on eBay that says, if you deliver the van to me here in Michigan, I will pay you? Now, why would I want to do that? Cause, right, because if, 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 if I leave that to chance, then they're going to say, come get it, right? Uh, and I want it here. I don't want to go get it. And I want to make sure they actually produce what they say they're selling to me. Not a picture of it, but it here, right? So I could enter into that kind of agreement. He actually did the reverse. He had an agreement that he, he flew there inspected it, and then if he was satisfied with it, he'd buy it. Which still is a little risky, because you get down there and it's not what you want, then you're flying back. Or renting a car, I guess, and coming back. So, you guys see the difference between bilateral and unilateral? All right. Formal versus informal. This will trick you also. Most contracts are informal. Like a lot of people think of contracts, written, formal, not written, informal. But that's not what it means. Most written contracts and all oral contracts or implied contracts are informal. Only when the law requires a contract to be written in a specific form is it formal. That's what makes it formal, that statutory requirement to be in writing in that way. So if you don't meet the statutory requirements, then it's not. So in some situations, there are statutes that say a contract has to have a certain seal or something on it before it's a valid contract. Notice that doesn't mean every time you notarize a contract, it's now a formal contract. Again, only when the law requires it. Does that make it a formal contract? A check. Think of a check. Checks can be written on pretty much anything. They can be big. I have a buddy that has a huge check. Right? Um, doesn't matter what it's written on, how big it is, how little it is, but it has to have certain things on it before it is a negotiable instrument. Kind of think of it like that. 
Uh, if it doesn't require a special form, it's informal, then over on the right, express versus implied. Express means what? Or, or, or is spoken, right? A lot of people think express means in writing only, but express means expressed in words, and those words could be written or oral. So oral contracts are express contracts. Implied means not express. In other words, implied, implied contract is not a written contract and not an oral contract, which means if you see a scenario coming up at some point in the future where there's a written contract, it's not an implied contract. Or, you, or I put in the scenario that the parties orally agree. Then don't call it an implied contract. Yes. Are, do oral contracts hold up in court? They do, right? Well, um, oral contracts are valid and enforceable unless the law prohibits them, either because they're illegal or because they are supposed to be in a written form. So, so if you have a written agreement, can an oral agreement still hold up in court? Like if the or if like the verbal agreement goes against what the written right. agreement. Yeah, so as we get into uh, more of the rules about how the court interprets contracts or resolves disputes about contracts, if there is a writing, the court looks to the writing first. And if somebody says we had some other oral agreement, usually doesn't consider it, but it contradicts what's in the writing. So it's not a good idea to have both a written and oral agreement about the same thing because the court's going to look at the writing um, where, I, where I think most of you go with that is, can you really have an oral agreement because it's difficult to enforce in court? Yes, it is difficult. And don't get me wrong. You, if you reach an agreement with somebody, put it in writing. They're both valid contracts, but put it in writing because you don't want later there to be a dispute about it or any of the terms. If you have a written contract, like I was saying earlier, don't orally agree to something else. Put it in the writing. So, if we have written agreements and we have oral agreements, then what in the world would be an implied contract? How could you have an agreement when the parties don't write anything or say anything? Although, I'll modify that here in a second. I mean, I mean, does that bend your mind a little bit to think, how can you agree when you don't say or, do, you don't say or write something out? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most of the times it's implied. I mean, you know, when I go into Meyer, I, I announce I'm here to purchase something, you know. But most people just grab a cart and go, right? Uh, when I go up to the clerk, I go, I offer to purchase these goods from you. And I wait until I get an acceptance, either orally or in writing. But most people, they just let them ring it up, right? Try it. Go into Meyer, fill your cart full of stuff, and then, you know, go up to the register. Let them scan all your stuff. Don't talk to them because you don't want them to think you're entering into any oral agreement. And then when they're done, they ask you to pay for it. Go, what? You know, what? I didn't, I didn't offer to buy this. I didn't show me a writing that says I have to pay for this. Don't do that. But, I mean, you get the idea, right? It's implied when they put groceries out there that you might pick some, put them in your cart, and you're going to pay for them. Not put them in your cart and just stroll out the door with them. So, yeah, it, a lot of our contracts are formed that way. Uh, whether it's gas. Or what, I mean, when I go to gas, I, like the day that that winter storm was in, I went to Meyer, pick on Meyer. I'm filling up my tank. And there's a guy trying to talk to me from inside. Boy, that irritates me. <laughs> like, if I wanted to go inside and talk to you, I would have done that. But I'm out here at the pump. I got my own card. I've ran it. I'm, I can't understand what you're saying anyway. It's like, rah, 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 rah. I hear four. Yeah, that's me. What? You know? Right. I'm like, what? <laughs> whatever they're saying, I don't want to talk to them. So I pull up. 
I run my card. I'm filling it. It's, it's implied I plan to pay for it in that when I pump, it's going to be gas that goes into my tank without any type of actual agreement. So, yeah. We go up to a pop machine. You don't say, I offer to, to buy pop, and it doesn't talk. Well, it talks back to me, but generally it's implied. So the conduct of the parties can imply that there is a contract. And that's pretty much what these slides talk about, each, each part of that diagram. Um, a bilateral contract is a promise in exchange for another promise. And as we mentioned earlier, every contract has to have at least two parties. You don't agree with yourself. You might, you might promise yourself lots of things, but you don't sue yourself if you don't do it. I do, but you probably wouldn't. A uh, unilateral contract, and there's not much new on this, uh, you know, the idea that you, you offer to do something if somebody else does something for you. You promise in exchange for an act. Uh, the examples are new. Like how is a lottery an example of a unilateral contract? And when is it formed? Well, you're going to have to be more specific than that. Because I've tried that. I call them up. I'm like, man, you won't believe this, but I picked the numbers. Now, I know I didn't buy a ticket, but I swear those are my numbers. I picked them in my head. Right? That didn't work. One time he even called them like, yeah, I got the ticket right here. Trust me. They didn't buy that either. So it's not when you buy the ticket. It's not when you call them up. What do you have to do to enter into a contract with them? No, oh, that'd be cool. I'd like to buy one and then say, give me my money. You got to buy a ticket and win. Buy a ticket and win and what? What is it you have to do? Present. Yes. Yeah, if you read the fine print, you have to present the actual winning ticket somewhere, somehow. If you can't do that, you don't win. I mean, it's... Let's say you actually bought a ticket and you have the winning numbers and then you lose the ticket. Guess what? No contract. Because there's an offer to pay the person who delivers the winning ticket. And substantiate that they purchased it. Right? And there's all kinds of issues about people who get together and buy tickets together. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that would be a bummer. That's another bummer. How about the people, I saw this on the news this morning, who paid $900 for a Super Bowl ticket and got there and didn't have a seat? They got, they got to sit in the basement and watch it on the TV. They gave them triple the price of the ticket. Oh, they did? Because they knew they were going to get sued for it. So they got like $2,700 back. That's not too bad. What's that? They sold these tickets and they planned on giving them special seating and then they got there and they didn't have a seat for them. Oh, probably. Probably the law. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm going to sell seats in my basement for like 500 a pop. That'd be a good deal. Imagine that, flying there, paying the fly there, getting there. It's freezing. Say, hey, I got my $900 ticket and I'm going, sorry. Can't come in. All right, now, revocation of an offer. Here's the general rule. Here's the old rule. And it still has some application. An offer can be revoked any time prior to acceptance. I don't see a lot of you writing that down. Hopefully you got it. <laughs> Say it one more time. An offer to enter into a unilateral contract can be revoked, taken back, any time before somebody accepts it. So translate that into what we said. I yell out at the neighbor kid, I'll give you five bucks if, I, if you salt my driveway. What could I do before he salts my driveway? Yeah, never mind. Right? I, I'll do it myself. Now, 
And the modern view says once he starts, he should be able to finish. That's what that translates to. I mean, you can see that, right? He's halfway done. He gets all the hard part, and then I yell, I revoke my offer to enter into a unilateral contract. So the modern view is that once somebody has started to perform, they ought to be able to finish and get paid. Think about it. You're selling your car on the front lawn. When can you decide you don't want to sell it? Right. Take it out of your lawn, take the sign out of the window, anytime before you sell it. So somebody comes along later, they're like, where's your car? What do you mean? Well, you had a car with a sign in it. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm not going to sell. Oh, too late, I saw the sign. No. <laughs> you can revoke, you can change your mind, you can decide you don't want to sell it, unless you agreed to sell it. Once you do, in a bilateral contract, you got to. Well, yeah, I mean, even without it. I mean, the idea of a deposit is some in, there, there's always a potential for a breach. Something happens. The idea of a deposit is it might motivate the other party not to breach. But regardless of whether you take it or not, if somebody doesn't do what they promised to do, it's still a breach. It's just one gives you immediate access to money, the other is you might have to sue them to compel them to pay whatever your damages are. All right. We talked about formal versus informal and express versus implied. Here are the three factors that you need for an implied in fact con a contract. It's based on the conduct of the parties and the plaintiff, the one who's now suing, needs to show that they did provide something to the other party, the defendant, some type of service or product. And when they did it, it wasn't voluntary for nothing. It was expecting to be compensated for it. And then the last part is the defendant took whatever was provided, had a chance to reject it, but didn't. So a while back ago, I was... Uh, running with a buddy of mine and he said true green of course it's to tell you how long it's been since I ran um, true green sprayed his lawn while he wasn't home and then stuck the bill on his door and he never asked for it so we're running and he says should I have to pay for that because even just like students all my friends want free legal advice <laughs> and I I said, well, it depends. You're right, I did. I was winded, so I couldn't say a lot. I said, it, it, it depends, right? So um, what would it depend on? Let me throw it back at you. Whether he agreed to help it out. And I told you he didn't. Whether he had a chance to. Right, that's what it gets down to. Did they provide a service? Yes, they did, although it's arguable. Maybe he didn't think it was that great of a service. Um, when they did it, did they expect to get paid? It wasn't free, we'll just spray everybody's lawn day. They made a mistake. They sprayed his lawn. When they did, they thought they were spraying the right lawn and they expected when they did it to get compensated because they put a bill on his door. But what's the problem? The last one. He wasn't there. He didn't have any chance to reject. Therefore, he shouldn't have to pay. Ethically, maybe that's another issue. But even that runs into problems because then True Green could run around spraying everybody's lawn and then just expecting them to pay for it, whether they asked for it or not. Which has come up. I'm using True Green generically without picking or, or trying to commit defamation against them, right? I mean, it could be any lawn service who was getting paid and then you cancel the service, the word doesn't get back, and then they keep on doing it. They're still expecting to get paid, but they've been told, don't do it. Yeah, I mean, you think of it, any service provider. Question? Comment? All right, so you need all three of those things. Watch for all three of those things. I, I had a case where um, a client came to me and said, 
somebody came and paved my driveway. <laughs> what? Yeah. I mean, what if you come home, your house is painted, it's, it's sided, or your driveway is paved, and you didn't ask for it to be done? Should you have to pay for that? Should they end up having to pay for it? No. <laughs> That'd be a bummer. What if they come and wreck your house thinking that it was your house that was supposed to be made over? <laughs> Whoops. I wonder if that's ever happened. I mean, police certainly knock on the wrong door and execute warrants on the wrong house. I wonder if they ever demolished the wrong place. I know they've demolished the wrong buildings before. All right. Uh, executed versus executory. An executed contract is a contract where everybody has done everything they're supposed to. It says both sides, but like we said, it might be multiple parties to the contract. But, and everybody has done everything they're supposed to in the contract. It's fully performed. It's executed. Another word for an executed contract is a done contract, right? There's nothing left. Everybody's done everything. An executory contract is when at least one of the parties hasn't done at least one thing. In other words, there's still something left by somebody. Think about, you know, the example of buying a car. I don't have enough money to pay cash for a car, so I borrow money and I make payments over time. That contract continues to be executory, right? Because I still have an obligation. I still have something I need to do. Now I've managed to pay off both my vehicles. Uh, so now, is the contract done? What needs to happen after I pay off my vehicles? Uh, right, I need clear title to it. So I need something that removes the lien that they have. So they have an obligation under the contract to do that. So the contract remains executory, even though I've made all my payments until they've done what they need to. Why is that important? Like we're just using these terms. Because I still want the ability to sue them if they breach by failing to perform and remove that lien. And until then, you can't sell it or credit it. Right. You try, you try to sell it to somebody else, and you're like, trust me, I've made all the payments. And they go... We don't care. This still shows there's some kind of lien holder. I actually had the reverse one time. I had, if, has anybody ever leased a vehicle? Like if you lease a vehicle, you don't have title to it. Someone else has title to it, and they let you use it, and you pay them, and then maybe you can buy it later. GM sent me the title to the vehicle I was leasing in my name. What? Yeah, I was like, thank you. And they, then they, they sent me a letter that started out, oops. <laughs> Thanks for the call. All right. Well, what would you do on that? Well, you know me. I was like, oh, I can't take this. Get your number. <laughs> no. No it, was a, it, no, it was a mistake. It was a mistake. It was a, a clerical error. And it, so, anyway. Ah, so yes, this is where all this is heading, is once one of the parties fails to perform, does that give you the right to not perform? And the answer is, it depends, right? Because in some situations, maybe it does. Some situations, maybe it doesn't, because it depends on whether the breach is material or enough. Like just, I mean, we'll talk about this more, but if you look around the room, look above the blue stripe back there. Do you notice anything? See, you guys get, right, you guys get to look at me the whole time, but I have to look at that. Anyway, somebody's got the better deal there. But, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not perfect, complete performance, is it? Like if they did that in your house, you'd be, nah, I don't think so. So then the question is, do I have to pay when that's what they deliver? But you end up in court, and they claim they didn't do a good job because you didn't pay them, right? And you claim you didn't pay them because they didn't do a good job. And it all comes down to who's able to establish, I did perform, they didn't perform good enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's, that's just what it's about. So... Like, I contract to have my house built. 
uh, if it gets time for it to be done and the builder gives me the keys and says, here you go, and I look up, there's no roof on it, it's clear there's a problem. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to pay you the full amount for that. So I should be able to spend, I shouldn't have to pay everything for something that I didn't get, right? But that often becomes the issue in a contract is how much is good enough? What if he does everything but then misses a spot? I can't go, I'm not going to pay you. That's what, that's what lawsuits are about. Right. Well, or, or get them to fix it. Right. All right. Here we have the three V's and some other stuff. Valid, voidable, and void contracts. And a valid contract is a contract that has all four elements. What are the elements? Anybody remember? Legal capacity and, and purpose or legality, right? Yeah, good. So you need those things, and if you're missing one, it's not a valid contract. That's pretty straightforward. A void contract is kind of an oxymoron, which means it's, I, I don't know what that means, because, right, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a contradiction. Void contract is not a contract. You shouldn't call it a contract. It's void. It means it isn't one to start with. Thank you. <laughs> and then, how come you guys don't applaud like that? What's going on? And then, yeah, I know. And then there's voidable, which is, get this, a voidable contract is a valid contract that somebody can back out of. So don't get confused. Voidable contracts are valid contracts. They really are contracts. But for some reason, a party can avoid, or maybe both the parties can avoid them. Like what kind of reason? Uh, minors is a good example. We were talking about that earlier. Minors can contract, but then they can also back out of them in a lot of situations. That's why you don't want to sell to minors unless you have someone else co-sign or, or enter into an agreement with somebody who's an adult because they could then change their mind. Do minors buy things that they can't afford? Yes. So what, adults do that too, by the way. Right. So valid contract that one of the parties could avoid. Um, and we'll come up with some other examples as we go along of when you could avoid your obligations under a contract without it being a breach. All right. An enforceable contract is a valid contract taken a step further that can be enforced in court and there's no legal defense. See how that's another step? Like with a valid contract, all we're saying is it is a contract. With an enforceable contract, we're saying it is a contract that will be enforced in court. There won't be a defense against it. And we'll talk about some situations where we could have defenses against enforceability of the contract. Thus, that makes an unenforceable contract one that can't be enforced. Even though it is a contract, it can't be enforced because somebody has a valid legal defense to it. And as we mentioned, a void contract is no real contract. And that's what the three V's are here. Valid has all the elements. Voidable has all the elements, but could be avoided. And a void contract is not a contract. All right. Here's kind of a weird one. Quasi-contract, or as my friend in law school used to say, quasi-contract. <laughs> but a quasi-contract is a fake contract. It is the only contract that the court creates after the fact. So let me give you an example. The one in the book is like the worst example the one where the physician runs around saving people and then putting bills on their chest, apparently. So, um, not that mine's any better, but let's say I'm up here talking and I pass out. And um, besides all the jokes about what you're going to do while I'm passed out, 
Let's just say, because I've done that before. Um, let's say you decide to take me over to the hospital. And you wheel me in, and they say, Mr. Brand, would you like medical treatment? And I say, nothing, because I'm unconscious. Uh, and they go, I know, I know. Let's watch him and see if he engages in any conduct, which implies. What do I do? Nothing. I know, let's, let's get him to sign something. Nothing. I'm, I'm unconscious still. Right? So then they treat me. And you guys are all anxiously waiting to see if I'm okay. Right? And then we all, want, we all want to come back here to keep on going, right? And uh, as I'm leaving, they're like, pay us. Are you kidding me? I'm a lawyer. I know better than this. We don't have a contract. Am I right? Yes, I am. Rule number one. I am right. There is no contract. I just got through telling you that. I just got through telling you there's no writing. There's no implication. I didn't do any, engage in any conduct that led them to believe I wanted a contract. I didn't say anything. I was unconscious. Now, yes. what if I was like, what if I called 911 and the came? Right. Well, that would be different. Then you've got to pay for me. No. Right. Uh, my point that I'm making is that this is the court in a situation where there isn't a contract whipping up one to avoid me being unjustly enriched. How am I unjustly enriched? Because I got helped and I'm not paying. Right? This actually protects, right, this protects both of us. Right? I, if not, what would they have to do when somebody comes in who's unconscious? Wait. Or watch me. See if I do anything that indicates I want help. Right? So, this is the only situation. If you see a scenario or it's on the exam where I'm talking in the scenario about there being a contract, you don't get this. You only get this when there's not a contract. Question? Yeah. Not by me. It's implied in fact contract is a contract that's implied by the conduct of the parties. Yeah, maybe they are, but I'm not doing anything. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's the point. I can't do anything. I'm unconscious. So you're just supposed to lay up? Oh, well. Right, this is the point. Is It's not a contract, but the court is going to make me pay anyway. Because if they don't have that remedy here, then I'm going to die. And then the hospital's not going to get paid. Yeah. What if then in the fact that like, you have a certain condition, you tell the class to like, call <laughs> not, 911, you tell them that I need this and this and this. And you have well, certainly, yeah, you can change the circumstances. Like you wheel me over there and all of a sudden I come to and go, help! And then I you know, go unconscious again. I mean, you can come up with all kinds of scenarios where I actually do say or do something which implies I do want help. Right? Yeah, well, um, let's keep thinking about that question. I want to make sure that you guys understand this because the whole idea that, like, I wake up and I've got something I didn't come in with, that, you know, that's, that's another issue. This issue is about whether we have an agreement or not. And we don't. We can't because I didn't say, do, or write anything. Right? Now, if I did, then the question is, did they perform uh, as they promised in the contract? Which then goes to your question of, did you end up with something different or whatever? Like, what if I go in there and I enter into an agreement for them to remove something and they remove the wrong thing? Or there are complications because of what? Right. Or they sew me back up and leave some things in there. Right? Bonus. No. <laughs> I mean, that happens. Yeah. They cut off the wrong thing. All those things go to the quality of the performance, not whether there is a contract or not. All right. But yeah, those, those type of questions do come up. All right, agreement. An agreement is needed for a contract, and it has two components. We already mentioned this, offer and acceptance. And the offer is the offeror, the one who's making the offers, promise to perform. 
Either way you look at it, bilateral or unilateral contract. I offer to pay you, kid, if you salt my driveway. Or I could offer to perform and put it into a written contract with him where he agrees to do it in writing beforehand. Now, an offer has to be serious, objectively. Not what the parties say, like later, oh, I was just joking, but from the circumstances. Do they intend to enter into contract? Anybody look at that case? Lucy v. Zimmer. Lucy's not a girl, by the way. But in this case, there's a couple drunk farmers. I thought you guys would be into that. And they were gambling. No, I just added that part. Um, so there's uh, a couple drunk farmers, and they're, um, they're having one of those nights where they start bragging, and then apparently at some point they enter into an agreement to buy and sell land, and they write it up, and they get the wife to witness it. And then later, one of the parties says, I was drunk, I didn't know what I was doing, I was just kidding. And the court says, nope. Objectively, you, I mean, maybe you were drinking. But objectively, looking at the facts, the facts that you put a writing there, you had someone else take a look at it, and it appears to, that the terms are reasonable that you were capable of knowing what you were doing. Another way it has to be serious is uh, jokes or like if I walked out to my Jeep today and I kicked the tire and I said, boy, I'd sell this thing for a buck and you walk by, you're like, here you go, right? That, that's not, that's me just upset at my Jeep. It's not me trying to sell you my Jeep for a dollar. <laughs> right. So uh, sometimes that's the case. What, like what if I put an ad in the paper that says I'll sell my Jeep for, I don't know, something more reasonable, $5,000. And then 10 people call me. Does that mean I have to sell it to all of them? No. So it, it can't be an offer that they all accept because then I'd have to sell it to all of them. So it's really an invitation for them to make an offer to me, and then I can pick and choose who I want to accept. Only then would there be a contract. Or an opinion, or negotiations beforehand. Those things aren't the actual offer. Or my agreement that I will sell you at some point in the future, my Jeep, is not enough to be an offer. So we've talked a lot about how it needs to be serious, it needs to be definite, it needs to be clear. My Jeep, that one there for this particular price. But this last one here, communicated to the, offer, uh, to the offeree. You can only accept an offer that you know about. Let's say you find a little dog running around, right? And you bring it back to the owner. And as you walk away, they say thank you. As you walk away, on the pole, you see a reward sign. Then you go back and like, oh, can you give me the reward? Are they obligated to pay you? No, because that reward offer is something you would have to accept. That's why you hold the dog hostage and you tell them, I've got your dog. And I, you know. But basically, you get the idea. You can't accept an offer that you don't know about in the first place. All right, how are offers terminated? Well, we mentioned revocation, right? Withdrawing, taking back your offer. Unless you enter into some type of agreement that your offer can't be revoked. If anybody's ever heard of an option contract, let's say you want to buy land. You could buy the land, or you could buy the option to buy the land. Now, why would you only want to buy the option to buy the land instead of buying the land. You might, not want you might not want it later, right? But you want to reserve the right to buy it later. Is that only with land? What's that? Is that only with land? Well, you could enter into other, there's stock option. I mean, there's other types of options that are agreements, right? Um, but generally, uh, you can, like we said earlier, revoke an offer. Another way that you can have an offer be terminated is when the other party rejects it. 
So I offer to sell you my Jeep for 5000 You say, no way. That's a clear rejection. Here's the one that will trick you. What if I say, I offer to sell my Jeep for 5000 You say, uh, I'll take it for four. <laughs> you said, I'll take it, right? Let's say you even use the words, I accept your offer for four. Is that really a, an acceptance? No. no. Instead, it's a what? It's a rejection and a counteroffer. The point is, once that's made, there's no more offer on the table. So my offer of five is no longer there because you rejected it. And you reject it by saying, no way, or sure, and then change all the terms, right? That would be a counteroffer. And then the last one up there, it, the, uh, the, the acceptance needs to mirror the offer. They need to be the same in order for it to be an actual acceptance. All right. Uh, other ways that an offer could be terminated, the law could terminate it because the time has expired if it was for a period of time. My Jeep blows up. It's hard for me to sell it to you if it's blown up because you know I drive it into old ladies. Um, uh, death or incompetence of the party. If I'm dead, it's more difficult for me to perform under a contract. Uh, and then for some reason, after we agree, maybe the law says it's illegal for us to do that anymore. All right. Uh, acceptance. I still got about two minutes according to my watch here. Could be. It has to be a voluntary act, but it could be written. It could be oral. It could be silence. Taking the goods and paying for them would be the same as saying, I accept and I'll pay for them. Shipping the goods in some situation would be considered an acceptance. I want those. Oh, here you go. And you can communicate that by any reasonable means. The mailbox rule says that the acceptance is effective as soon as it's put in the mailbox. You see how that could cause a problem? Like even before the other party knows that the contract is formed, the acceptance is in the mail, that is a contract. So sometimes you might want to restrict your ability to accept an offer that way. All right, in the last minute I have here, let's see if there's anything really pressing. Um, let me just talk about online contracts and online acceptances a little bit here. All right, so um, on that last objective we had, all those things that we talked about we could do in writing, orally, implied, uh, we can enter into contracts online too. We do it differently, usually. The most common way is we click on something, right? There's some terms. And basically the way the general rule is, as long as we can click, click on it, and here's an example of it. Anybody ever try to read through a Microsoft agreement? It's a little long. But as long as you can see the terms of the agreement before you accept, that's good enough. Even though you don't actually look at them or read them. Do I read them? Oh, you bet. <laughs> I mean, you're like stuck. You're stuck with, if I read this and I, if I don't agree to this, what's going to happen? You don't get it, right? So, yeah. 10 pages, I got 100 pages maybe. Uh, and then shrink wrap, I don't know. Anybody buy their stuff in boxes anymore? If you do, right? Yeah, so maybe, maybe you do. In that case, courts have even said that those are lawful because you can open them and still decide whether you want to agree to them or not, which is kind of a, a bummer because then you can't take it back in some cases, right? But uh, the limitation is, the problem with these is, if there's no way you could know what you're agreeing to, then it's not an agreement. Right? So if there wasn't a link or there was no way for you to know what you're agreeing to till after you accepted it, that's when you have a problem. All right, we'll stop there. And remember, go look at that, those group questions, come up with your answers, come prepared next time to talk about it as a group.
Um, uh, yeah, there's three questions.